And our presenter today is my friend, Jeff Wazalewski. He's an extension agent in uh, Miami-Dade County, or where when I grew up there, we just called it Dade County, but now it's Miami-Dade County. Uh, he has over 25 years of horticultural experience, and he is known as our tropical fruit production extension agent in South Florida. So he knows all things tropical fruit, and he's very active in the community. He's well loved by the farmers and the residents and the master gardeners down in Miami-Dade County and beyond. He is our known um, go-to guy for all things tropical or slash, as he will tell you, subtropical fruits soon. So Jeff, I welcome you to the Master Gardener webinar. We're so glad that you can be with us. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and let you go ahead and share along, okay? Thank you so much. Jeff, you didn't mention that I was wearing Barbie pink today, but I just did because of the Barbie movie. I just wanted I just to just started that talking. <laughs> The next thing out of my mouth was, in that picture, uh, there was a very high chance that I would have been wearing that same shirt today, but I wasn't. Okay. I have a very tight rotation on my shirts, <laughs> and it's very nice to see you in a Barbie pink. There okay. you go. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Okay, Jeff, you're buffering. Come on back. Mm -hmm. Jeff, please come back. We've got a lot of tropical fruit. Um, and these two are not my, my wheelhouse. These are two that when Wendy said, um, Oh, you can do, can you do something on dragon fruit? I never say no. So I was like, sure. Uh, and then she said, if you need to fill in the time, you can do finger lime too. And I'm like, oh boy, those two are rough for me. So we're going to do something called extension today. Um, I'm going to be using information, a lot of information from a lot of the uh, specialists at the Tropical Research Education Center. The first one here is Jonathan Crane. So we're going to be talking about general, um, general information about dragon fruit. And then we're going to talk about pathogens. So we're going to use information from Dr. Romina Gaziz. And then we're going to talk about um, pests. And then we're going to use information from Dr. Daniel Carrillo. And then to finish it all off, we'll do finger limes. And with finger limes, we're going to go to the expert, Dr. Uh, Manuel Dujit. So we'll, I think I butchered his name, but I'll, fin I'll polish that up when we get to the slide. So here we go. So like I said, extension. We have an extension office in all 67 counties. You guys know that. But down here in South Florida, we have the Tropical Research Education Center. So I'm dipping into that knowledge and I'm extending that to you. That's extension. Uh, I do have something, a shameless promotion here called Tropical Fruit Tuesdays. It's um, a monthly webinar that's free. We just did IPM Pests and Pathogens. And in August, we're going to do Tools of the Trade. And then in September, we're going to do Cold Protection. So one of the reasons I love Wendy Wilbur is because of the alliteration in her name. And you know I love alliteration because <laughs> there she is, because Tropical Fruit Tuesday is at two. That's it's all right there. It tells you all you need to know. And then I'm going to do uh, Tropical Fruit Tuesdays live August 1st. We're going to do some tree pruning. And that's Tropical Fruit Tuesdays live at 10. So there you go. All the Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, there's been 21 different ones. They're all on YouTube. So you can go to YouTube and search Tropical Fruit Tuesdays. You'll find all these. You are getting a quiz at the end, so you take a quick screenshot. Uh, I like to always start with where should I get information? You guys are experts at this, so I won't drill you too hard on this, but your best place is Ask IFAS. used to be called EDIS. So search out Ask IFAS, put in your, your um, subject, and you get lots of good information that's peer-reviewed, written in a way that everyone can understand. 
uh, other universities. You can search your subject with EDU, YouTube, all the Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, like I said, but you also have just a huge amount of things that you can actually see them doing. So when you need to learn how to hand pollinate a dragon fruit, you can go there, watch four or five videos on that. You'll be an expert. Master gardeners. Does anyone know any master gardeners? Are there any master gardeners in the house? You're a great place to get information. Plant clubs and societies, another thing, join a plant club, join a society. Uh, social media, great place. Number one place is your own garden or your own grove. You must pay attention to your own garden and your own grove. You can teach yourself to pay attention in your garden. And that's where you're going to learn the most and you're going to know it's true because you see it with your own eyes. And then finally, beware the source of your information. Just because it comes up when you search it, the first thing uh, does not mean it is correct. So dragon fruit, pataya. You can't have a cooler name than dragon fruit. And you can't have a, a cooler uh, way to grow fruit than on these big huge cactus that you have to grow on poles. So they are uh, a cactus. They can grow about 20 feet. They're vines, uh, triangular. They have aerial roots, which adhere to the surface in which they grow. So you need to give them something to crawl up. And flowering is induced by long days. So the flowers, bisexual, they're beautiful. They're huge, they're large. Um, and the pulp of the fruit can be white, yellow, or red. The black seeds are very small. You can eat the seeds. I was speaking with Wendy uh, before we came on live, and you really, the pink has is, is got more flavor. The red, the pink, red, red has more flavor. The white is very, got a lot of texture, but not as great of a flavor, in my humble opinion. So the, the flower is kind of open at night. This is when you get your pollination. And it's thought that they're pollinated by baths or bats <laughs> or moths. Uh, and then Dr. Korea, our entomologist, he's a tropical fruit entomologist. He has another idea, which we'll touch on at the end. So if you cut one in cross section, it looks like that. There's a big, beautiful flower. There's a young, immature fruit. See fullest finds, and then when they get a little mature, they turn pink. Once they turn pink, you can wait about seven or eight days, and then they should be mature, and you can pick them when they turn pink on the, on the vine. So here's the flower, this big monster. Then it opens up. Then it turns into this little fruit over here, and then you have the color. So we have the, these are, species and the pulp color. Don't worry too much about all this, um, but the ones in bold are the ones that you're typically going to see. The red outside, red inside, red outside, white inside. So these three. Now you might at the end have questions about cultivars or varieties, like which is the best one. Well, when these came in, they got all sorted up and they got all mixed around. So Nobody really knows the best cultivars or the best varieties. I'm using that word interchangeably um, because they got all mixed up. So we don't know what's what. That's the, the honest truth. Um, so what you want to do when you get one, I would go red, red, and if you're going to grow it, and I would go with one that it can pollinate itself fairly well, if you can ask. Uh, whoever's selling it to you. So here's the, the red with the white inside. Uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Israel, excellent quality pulp. Like I said, this is Jonathan Crane saying that. I would say not as great. Uh, may need to be hand pollinated. And that's true for all of these. And then here's the other two. Now the yellow, you might try to grow the yellow. We can't really grow the yellow in Florida. People have tried it. They can get a little bit out of it, but we just don't have the, um, the climate for it. So when you see this in the stores, it's imported. 
So like I said, pollinators are thought to be moths or bats. Hand pollination is feasible, but it's very labor intensive. So for you guys, if you're not growing this commercially, I think hand pollination is the way to go. Um, and then, like I said, when the peel turns red, usually the fruit is ready seven to 10 days later. Now, propagation. I love propagation, so I get a little excited about this. Um, this is an easy one. Like mangoes, avocados, canistel, longan, or um, canistel, mame, sapodillas, those all need to be grafted, jackfruit. Um, this is one that you can do from cuttings and grafting and cuttings is a big difference. Cutting is a, a very easy, grafting is very difficult. So in these containers here, this was a grower that I visited who was having trouble with some, some weevil eating her flowers. So I actually took um, Dr. Carrillo, the entomologist with me. And it's never good when the entomologist gets excited because he got really excited because this was something we hadn't seen before. It was a weevil that was eating the flowers and that's not something we'd ever seen before. So not good for the industry, but the entomologist, like I said, super excited, but never, never good when he's excited or the pathologist. Uh, so anyway, they were growing more. So what you do is you take a cutting or multiple cuttings and you let them cure seven to eight days. You just put them in the shade. You let them kind of heal up seven to eight days and then uh, you can put them in the containers and then they'll start rooting. And you see here they have um, two or three in each container and they just have a little bamboo pole and they tie them up. So those will start to root. Once those start to root, you can move them into a bigger container or into the ground. And remember, they're going to need heavy structure to grow on. Now, most cuttings, you take a cutting, you dip it in root hormone and then you, you stick it into your mix. But this is different. So don't do this like your normal cutting. So there's some cuttings that are rooting. So sometimes there's really not a lot of grafting going on. Um, and then, like I said, the vines can be put in the soil or containers and three to four year old vines may produce 200 pounds of fruit each. So the trellising, here's some examples. You have a four by four with some rebar. Uh, you have um, four by four with some two by fours at the bottom. And I had one earlier that was a PVC with rebar put through it. So this has to be strong. Um, so if you're gonna do this, think it out. Dig a good hole, put concrete in the hole, put your four by four at least, maybe even bigger, and then have some good, good heavy stuff at the top. You're not going to be able to do rebar like that, but you can put a few rebars through the um, through the four by four. So you guys won't be growing these too packed in, I'm sure but commercial growers need to have space. See the one at the top doesn't have a good amount of space. So you're gonna be harder to manage, harder, harder to harvest. You're gonna get more disease, you're gonna get more pests. And when we talk about disease and pests, um, you're not gonna find another tropical fruit that gets as many diseases as dragon fruit. So for pruning, this is another thing that I love, propagation and pruning. Um, you want to remove damaged, weak, diseased stems and ones that are touching the so soil. And you want to do that after harvest. So after harvest, you take all your fruit off, you come in, you clean everything up. Now with dragon fruit, you need to clean your, your clippers in between each cut because you can pass all these diseases that we'll see in a minute, you can pass them from one to the other. So some photo acknowledgements, more acknowledgements. There's Dr. Ramina Gaziz, Daniel, 
and Cheng Crane Hong, Ian McGuire, Dr. Crane. Now we get into diseases. So we're stepping into the world of Dr. Romina Gaziz. She's the pathologist for um, the Tropical Research Education Center. And she's really taken a liking to tropical fruit. So she really does a lot of work with tropical fruit. Um, so here you see a lot of the different uh, diseases Make sure I don't go too far. Yep. So here's all the diseases that they can have. Luckily, there's only five that are in South Florida, which you see in green. So the diseases in dragon fruit, very common during the rainy season. The symptoms are not unique. So you can't just look at one and say, oh, it's this, because they overlap a lot. A lot of times one pathogen will come in and open the door for others. So you get a lot at the same time, mostly uh, fungal. And like I said, lesions create secondary pathogen roots. So anthracnose, this is one we know from mangoes and a lot of other tropical fruit. They are small little spots. They can get bigger quickly. Uh, fruiting bodies have millions of spores and you get a yellow halo. It can be a secondary invader. So this, you see this picture here, that's your anthracnose, but maybe something else got in there first. Uh, Alternaria, it's another one that gets on other tropical fruit and you see the, the spots. There, you see the, the fruit has damage there. Uh, bipolaris, the fruit rot. There you see um, damage on the fruit, which obviously this wouldn't work out for a commercial grower. Um, so here, I just want to show you these spots look very similar on the alternate area to the bipolaris. So this was the second worst disease in 2019 and not as common in 2020 and 2021. I hope you can't see this little pop-up box that's coming into my screen because I'm battling with it right now. Uh, okay, so we did this. Okay, fruit and stem canker. This is a big one. This is the one that gets onto um, dragon fruit, vines, and fruit. Uh, very bad. We have a QR code there, which should still be active if you want to. That It's probably going to go to the Edis that we wrote on this. So the lesions become larger, they turn orange or red, they can have a yellow or brown halo. Uh, fungus like the other, like anthracnose, produces many fruiting bodies, which contain millions of spores, which are dispersed by water splash and wind, landing on healthy tissues and starting a new infection cycle. So what does that tell us? When we grow our dragon fruit, we don't want to water from up above. We want to water the roots and that's it because the water can splash things around. Now we know rain is going to do that, but we don't need to help it by watering from up above. So if you have irrigation that's getting high up, um, shut that off for your, your, really I would shut that off for all of your plants. You want it down low where the roots are because you don't want to be splashing around these diseases. So here's what it looks like. It's really ugly. Then it moves to the fruit. Now it says here, it needs to be addressed before the crops start to bloom because you don't want it to jump to the flowers and the fruit. The issue we have with a lot of tropical fruit is that it's not like corn or wheat where 
they're growing so, so, so many acres that the pesticide companies really want to invest into them. So you have dragon fruit, you don't have many acres, um, maybe a thousand, and that's it. So when you get all these diseases, we don't have things that are labeled to protect the plants from the diseases. There are very few chemicals that are labeled for dragon fruit and finger limes, I'm sure. Uh, so what, what does that mean? When a, when a pesticide is labeled for a fruit, that means it's legal to spray on it. If you look at a label and it says, you can spray this on mango, avocado, and lychee, but that's it. You cannot spray it on dragon fruit. Even though it might work, you can't spray it. If it says you can spray it on tropical fruit, then you can. Sooty mold, this is one I'm sure you guys know from other fruit and other plants. It's very common. So we know that we get rid of this by getting rid of the insect. Now here's one that might cause you to think, oh, I have a problem, but it's it's not from, or I have a disease, but it's not a disease, it's sunburn. So you might get this, let's say you had your, your plants going and then you pruned out a section and now a new section is getting exposed to, to a lot of sun where before it wasn't. So you get this sunburn. So young plants and sunburn, how do, we, how do we beat that? Well, what you wanna do is you don't grow your cuttings in a very heavily shaded area and then put it out in the full sun. And this goes for all plants, um, but it's important for dragon fruit that you grow it in some shade, maybe 30%, then you move it to 50%, or rather, um, you grow it in 70%, then you move it to 50%, you move it to 30%, then you put it in the sun. And if you don't have shade houses, which I don't think you do, you can just do that by being under a tree, being in shade, then being under a tree where there's more light, moving it out a little bit further. Um, so this is important for all plants, but you see the sunburn. Then we also have fertilizer burn and um, herbicide burn. So this is, I always preach, protect your plants, get something around your plants so you don't get the weed whacker in there, you don't get the herbicide in there. Um, and then fertilizer burn, I'm always talking about getting the fertilizer out and don't clump it. Here we see the fertilizer is pretty clumped and that's causing some, some damage there. It's not spread out. I don't want to see all these fertilizer granules right next to each other. Now fruit splitting, you get this in other fruit as well. That's when you're not watering um, at a regular intervals. You might just not water for a long time and then it gets a bunch of water all at once, then they'll split. Um, this happens with rain too. There's nothing you can do about that. But if you are irrigating to plump your fruit up, and keep it steady. Okay, now we go to Dr. Daniel Carrillo. He's gonna be giving us information on dryer fruit pests and beneficial acropods. So one thing that both Dr. Carrillo and I always uh, preach is monitoring. Monitor, monitor, monitor. I said, pay attention to your garden or your growth. That's the same thing as monitoring. You're out there, you're looking. Uh, I like to get here in the morning, take my coffee, walk my growth. I have a hundred different trees here and I'll be pruning some of them for um, Tropical Fruit Tuesday Live, August 1st at 10. Um, so, what you can do is do the same thing in your garden. You don't have to go every day. You should go a couple times a week. Take your beverage of choice and walk around, look at everything, monitor. These are groves and 
if we're going to do a grove, we can't hit everything at once. So you can do an X, you can do a W, you can do a Z, um, and then start over again with the X. And then of course, record everything. It might be a good idea for you too as gardeners to start keeping a journal of what you see and maybe what you plant and when you plant it. Oh, it's cool. So thrips, this is one, when I first saw this, I couldn't believe it. If you look down in the bottom right, you see this sort of like burned up fruit. That's from the, the thrips. They get onto the, the flowers when they're younger and then they, they damage, they, they feed and they cause this damage. So management, Dr. Creo is always going to give you the, the pest and then how to manage it. So you need to protect the flowers. You can do that with chemicals. Um, you need biological control. You can use pirate bugs, predatory mites. Um, and really, when, when you see biological control, you're not going to go and buy pi pirate bugs, right? You're not going to buy predatory mites. But you can attract them by keeping a very, uh, having a big variety of different plants in your garden and not spraying a lot of chemicals. That way you get a big, diverse amount of natural predators. Now, cultural control, weeds, nitrogen, irrigation. So too much irrigation, you're going to get pests. Too much nitrogen, too much growing and green, you're going to get pests. Remember, nitrogen makes the leaves green and makes them grow. Great for grass. Not good for tropical fruit. Potassium is good for tropical fruit. Um, and then the weeds, keep the weeds down because a lot of these thrips like to live in the weeds. Then chemical control. See, he has uh, one listed there that's not registered yet. So that just shows you how, what difficult process we have getting labeled. Leaf footed bugs, these guys poke, make little pokes. So for you guys, unless you're a commercial grower, I don't think it's a big a problem with the pokes. But for a commercial grower, obviously, it's going to um, be impossible to sell these things. So look for these bugs, observe, uh, keep the weeds down. You can just crush them. They're big enough. They're slow enough. Uh, and then chemical control and then repellent. Question mark, question mark. Aphids, this is, you see the flower there completely covered in aphids. So there's several species. They feed, form colonies on young leaves, produce honeydew, and then that's where you get your sooty mold that Dr. Gaziz talked about. So aphids, manage the flowers if you can with some light chemicals, biological control, and then again, watch the nitrogen. Don't go too heavy on the nitrogen. Mealybugs, different species, sap sucking. The adults protect the young and they do produce honeydew and do sooty mold, just like the uh, aphids. So pruning, you can do some pruning here to get rid of them. Um, you can use biological control. And again, keep a good variety of different plants in your yard. Try not to spray with heavy chemicals. Manage ants. This is interesting. I don't know if you know it or not, but ants are not so good for your plants because ants will pick up mealybugs and scale and take it from one spot from one plant to another plant. They, they farm these plants or they farm these insects to, um, to get the, the honeydew. So they're moving things around. So you need to keep the ants down. You can put sticky tape around the bottom of the trunk 
and that way the ants can't go up and bring things up. Um, and then again, watch the nitrogen. Army worms, any kind of caterpillar or butterfly that you want to get rid of, um, caterpillar, um, you can use Dipel, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's very, it doesn't have any bad side effects for, for humans or other pollinators. Um, it just kills what you need it to kill, but you do need to hit the caterpillar with it. Um, so you have to hit in the caterpillar stage. Scales, another one. So look at the trunk and stems, uh, cultural control, sanitation. Sanitation, he's putting it here, but this could be in all these sections. Sanitation is important, meaning that you want to prune out anything that looks very bad, and then you want to keep everything clean. So when you prune stuff out, don't just throw it on the ground because then those insects can get right back up. Prune it out and get it away from your, your mother plants. So pollination. We had um, earlier, Dr. Crane chimed in with um, moths or bats. And that would make sense why we're not getting great amount of pollination for our, um, for our dragon fruit because we don't get a lot of these big moths and, and bats. Um, but Dr. Carrillo thinks that you also have these little tiny sap beetles and we do find them in the plants and they don't do anything bad. Um, so we do think that they're causing, they're in there and they're moving around some of the things that need to get moved around to, to pollinate. So I put my money on the um, tropical fruit entomologist. Okay, we finish up with the finger line. Dr. Manjul Dutt, I was close on the name, I think. He's from the Citrus Research Education Center. So he's not, that's CREC, not TREC. Tropical Research Education Center, that's down here by me. Citrus Research Education Center is up to the north. But he is the finger line. Um, he's the finger line expert. He knows finger limes. When they first started talking about them, he picked it up the mantle and he ran with it. So um, I kind of got into the finger line club when somebody was at Trek, a student, and they wrote a paper on finger limes and they sent it to me to edit. And I really edited it heavily, and then it went back. Um, and then I went to Dr. Dutt, and it became an edis. So I got on that edis because of that heavy-handed uh, edit. So that's why I'm in the club. That's why he gave me all these slides. I already had these slides, because he wants me to promote the finger line, also known as citrus caviar. What is a finger line? It's a relative of citrus. It's very thorny. This is a problem with commercial growing. It's very, very thorny. For you, if you wanna try a couple plants, the thorniness, you can put on your gloves and you can be real careful. Um, but for commercial growing, it's a big problem. Then you have the juice vesicles, likened to caviar. If you look down at the bottom right, you see all those different color finger limes, different color juice vesicles. Um, so this is something that's often used to augment very fancy, very expensive adult beverages or around um, very expensive food, dinner plates like fish or something like that. So it's not something that you're going to say to eat out of hand like a mango. So this is where it comes from. If you look at um, 
Australia there down here, this box over here, it comes from this little area right here. Lots of um, buzz in the news about finger limes because it's so peculiar and it's a citrus relative. And they're expensive. So if you can grow them and you can find a bar or a restaurant that wants to buy them, you can sell them. So Australia has the most acreage of finger lime cultivation, small acreage in Asia, Europe, Africa, US, California, and Hawaii. And Florida, finger lime acreage is expanding as growers become aware of it. I don't know how much it's expanded. I know that some of my growers have in a limited amount. And I know at Trek, the research center, they have a block of finger limes that are doing quite well. So here they are in Hawaii. There you see about the size of the finger lime. And most fruit is consumed within the state. They flower fruit year long. That's because they just have that steady, steady temperature. So this is um, finger limes in California. And I was out in California with people from Trek, the research center team, and we were there to warn the people in California about laurel wilt because they don't have it yet. They have a much bigger avocado. Um, they sell a lot more avocados than we do. They have a much bigger commercial operation. So we were warning them about that. But while we were there, some of the avocado growers did have finger lines. And you notice this top right picture, how they grow. They're like a bush. They kind of grow up, not so much out. Um, to me, this is a perfect size for a tropical fruit tree. It's about um, seven, eight feet. It's about six foot wide. That's how I prune my mangoes, to keep them like that. And then if you notice, everything is on a hill in California. So if we look up, we see the next set of finger lines. So this is a good tree to have on these hilly areas because you don't have to prune them that much. Or pruning can be very difficult on these angles. So status in Florida, we have some older selections. And then we have some two new ones, UF Sunline and UF Red Line. And there's only seven to 10 acres of finger limes being cultivated statewide. And then the most significant challenge, which I mentioned before, is the harvest due to the thorniness of the bushes and the trees. So Sunline and Red Line, UF Sunline, UF Red Line. These are ones Dr. Good has been uh, key in developing. So what do we want to do? We want to utilize the germplasm to develop varieties that can thrive in Florida. We want to tap into that citrus greening, the HLB tolerance. These are citrus related to citrus, right? But citrus greening doesn't kill them. So they're very tolerant to it. Some might say resistant, but it's more tolerance, where they, they have it, but they don't go down from it. Um, and then we want to improve the quality, we want to improve yield. So this one is sun lime on the left, darker. This one is red lime on the right. Hmm. Maybe I'll call, maybe we could tell him to have sun lime be called red lime because it's more red. I'll make a call about that. So sun lime, 26 to 34 grams, about three inches, seeds, zero to six. Medium-sized scraggly bush, seven years or eight feet tall. So about what I thought. Precocious, that means that they put, bring fruit very young. And these are grafted. 
and the main bloom is in February and March. Yield data is limited, but a six-year-old mature tree can produce about 150 fruits. And you saw that fruit in the hand, it's pretty small. Um, so if you look at the bottom left, you see the spines there. Those look pretty, pretty dangerous. And then you see the spines where the flowers are, and then there's spines all in there in the, in the tree. So sun lime, immature, mature. You can have them in the same tree. That's sun lime, very pretty. So sun lime can get some scab. Fruit size is not uniform. It is HLB tolerant, and fruits do not hang on the tree following maturity, so they'll drop. So they're 18 to 24 grams. A um, little bit bigger than sun lime, but a lot more seeds. What do you guys think? I'm leaning sun lime at this point. I think I might be team sun lime. So there they are. So these are a little smaller, six feet tall. Young leaf flush is always red. They are also precocious and tolerant to HOV, which is citrus greening. They flower sporadically. Yield data is limited. These are really new things, so we don't have a lot of information on them. Uh, fruit size is not uniform, may require manual thinning. When you see manual thinning for something that has thorns like this, that's not something you want to get into. Because you know what thinning is. Thinning is taking out some of the smaller fruit so the bigger fruit can get even bigger. So, uh, And then fruits are prone to thorn damage. So our conditions are similar to Australia, Hawaii, and parts of California. The rarity of the fruit fetches a premium price. So just like any crop, the more that is planted, the less, um, or the more acreage there is, the less it's going to be worth because it's going to flood the market. And I'm sure I'll get the question like, how far north can these grow? They can grow just about to central Florida. And then here's South Florida. Here's a commercial planting that somebody did. So this is probably one of the biggest plantings in the state. So if you want some, uh, and one of the master gardeners that, that volunteers here, at the homestead office, she found some while she was at a nursery further up the state. But um, if you want to get the UF releases, the sun lime and the red lime, uh, here's three places that you could get them. I know bright leaf, I've heard of that one. So I'll finish up. Just Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, be there or be square. If you want to join, get on my email list, then I'll send you um, information about it. You can just sign up. And I want to thank you so much for your time. I really love Master Gardeners, and I'm glad you guys were able to be here today. Well, Jeff, we only had about 450 people with us today. So you're spreading your message far and wide. So I'm so happy that you were here. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions. Um, I'm gonna start with the dragon fruit questions first and then we'll go to finger limes. Uh, the first dragon fruit question is about how far north can the dragon fruit grow? Mm. They're a lot more tropical. So finger lime, you can get it to the center of the state, but dragon fruit, not much further than, I don't think, 
West Palm. I'm sure yeah. some of you guys Palm Beach. So the, have it because you. I know you guys love to sneak around in the panhandle with bananas and things like that. But um, and that, this would be one that maybe you could keep in a big pot and move it in and out. But I would say a little further than West Palm and keep it on the coast. So maybe like the bottom of Lake Okeechobee South kind of. Yeah, that's usually where the tropical fruit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, as far as the hand pollination of the dragon fruit, what time is best to do that? And you do you just take a a, a, a flower from each and put them together? How is that done? You're going to do it. I don't have a lot of experience with it, but you're going to do it at night. That's when the flowers open. Okay. So you got to put on your little bat outfit, your little right. you know ears and your wings. Yeah. and get out there <laughs> um this was this was one that why i mentioned that might be one i go to youtube and read all about it you know get get some visuals you're going to need a paintbrush a little you know a little paintbrush a little horsehair paintbrush you're going to need something to collect the, the pollen usually like with anonas they they open at different times the male and female parts are open at different times right it's a little harder but with the dragon fruit, the parts are just further apart, like the male part and the female part. Okay. So they just don't get together. So you could do it much more easily, I believe. Okay, that sounds good. Um, Basim is wondering what is the best uh, soil medium for propagation of the dragon fruit? Do you have a suggestion on that? Sure. Uh, remember, it's a cactus. So we want as much drainage as you can get. I wouldn't go 100% perlite, but I would go with a good media mix and then put in 50% perlite or at least 30% perlite. Mix yeah. that up and then use that. Really good suggestion. Um, and then can the dragon fruit recover from a sunburn? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right, I think that's about it for the dragon fruit, but I think it sounds like things are cha changing a lot with the um, with the dragon fruit as far as labeled pesticide and fungicide. Uh, so double check with Jeff. You can hang out on Tropical uh, Fruit Tuesdays and maybe ask him on that. Oh, um, does the invasive cactus moth feed on dragon fruit cactus? I don't know that moth. Okay, it's a pretty bad moth that we have. It's kind of it's kind of coddling moth. We have it up here. Okay. Um, and then uh, Joanne asked the same question I asked you earlier when we were off air. How do you tell the difference between a pink and red fruit from a white one when you're at the store? Jeff uh, instructed me to bring a small knife to Publix and cut <laughs> them. But Jeff, what is your official answer for that? Uh, official answer is at a grocery store, you can ask. And they will probably open it up for you because shopping is a pleasure. So, right. you know, take advantage of that. You can't tell just by looking at it. They're, they're red and they're red on the outside. There, you, there's no, no tip. So, yeah, um, I would. So, of course, you know, master gardeners are always pushing the limits. We have reports of uh, dragon fruit growing as far north as St. Lucie County and Sarasota County. But that's for our professionals is, uh, uh -huh. you know, our, our group. So the master gardeners. Master gardeners. That's right. We that all have zone nice. envy. Um, yeah. And if a dragon fruit does get frozen, will it come back from the ground? Or is that pretty much all she wrote on that? We have not had a freeze. We don't know. Okay. We have not had a freeze while we've been trying to grow them. Okay. So I let's would imagine um, there's not a lot under the ground. So I would imagine if they get zapped, they're going to get zapped. You know, if I knew a freeze was coming, I probably would bring propagation stems into the greenhouse and, you know, kind of preserve it that way. Um, yeah. That's for me. Uh, so let's move on to finger limes. A lot of people are asking about uh, HLB tolerance. And so you're seeing HLB tolerance. Um, and then they're also asking about growing in containers. And our FFL agent in uh, Sarasota said he's had one in a container for four years with good, with good luck. So that's good. What do you think about that? I, I think anytime you have a tree that stays relatively small, you can get away with it in a container. Mm -hmm. 
I always say, if you can get it in the ground, get it in the ground because it's so much easier with the watering. Um, these can do well in our different pHs. So you don't need to have them in a container to, to um, adjust the pH, but no problem doing it. I think it would be one that could lean, that could lend itself to, to being grown in a container. As long as you're on top of the watering, the fertilizing, remember you got to fertilize different with slow, yeah, yeah. slow release. Um, and then the, the soil mix, you can't let it get all mucky. You got to repot every once in a while. Uh, and then move it up from a, one size to another. Hey, someone is saying that um, dragon fruit is invasive in South Florida or in the Keys. Is that true? Uh, I saw something that they might make coconuts invasive. Oh, it is. Yeah. So invasive is kind of getting out there. But I'm going to go ahead and I've never seen a dragon fruit like move. I've never seen it move from one place to another. Like, okay, I'll I'll double check that while we're working seeds, on it. The seeds don't grow and the chunks can't move on their own. So it, it may be a different type of cactus. It might be a cirrus in which we know that the cirrus is a, is a yeah. problem. So that might be an issue there. Um, but let me go ahead and double check on that. Um, can you juice finger limes? I think you can juice anything with a strong enough Jeez. machine. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think it would be a good little added flavor. All right. Let me see. Um, and could someone's asking if they think that could finger limes and um, a sweet orange be crossed to make a sweeter one? I don't know if that would work. I'm sure if it, it could, that they're working on it. Because UF does not play around with citrus, they go hardcore. So if it's possible, they're going to do it, but I don't know that it can be done. Okay. Um, and uh, what about giant swallowtails on the finger limes? Is that something that would get on them? Huh, that I don't know. Well, it's I in the Rutaceae family, right? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's possible. So if it's Rutaceae, they would get on them. Yeah. Um, I will tell you that the cirrus cactus is invasive considered. Well, actually, the cirrus rapandus is not a species of concern um, according the, to the IFAS assessment. So we'll just have to watch that one to see how it goes. Um, someone is asking about the thorns. You know, is there a way to um, uh, deal with those or do you have any harvesting um, suggestions on that? I would go with some heavy duty gloves, be very careful. That's because the tree's not that deep. So you can probably get in there. Now there is, there is a tool, Wendy, you probably know about it, um, that they use to harvest lychees. It's like a long tool with a handle at one end, at the other end, it snips, it snips and it pinches and it holds. So you could use that and stick it in there and snip and pinch and hold and then pull it out if you really wanted to. But I think um, part of the allure is the danger. You know, you want that danger. <laughs> yes. Indiana Jones and get it. Whew. Yes, I know. Um, let's see. Someone says, Jim Quiz De Quiznell has removed hundreds of pounds of dragon fruit from county conservation land. I think it's a different, I think it's more the night blooming cirrus um, and not the hydro, hydro cirrus, but we can double check on that for you. And um, does the fruit of the finger lime taste like a lime? It's, it's, Close to it, yeah. Okay. What really gets you is the little vesicles when they pop. You okay. know, that makes it kind of cool and different. Good. Um, let's see. Someone asked if lychees have thorns. No, they do not. Um, and then Forrest says, Manjul mentioned there are they are doing lots of hybridization with finger limes. 
um, and that they are trying to pass along HLB tolerance. Finger limes also flower and fruit uh, in three years versus six to seven years for traditional citrus. So we could maybe get some cool hybrids in the future. So that's good. Someone's asked that you put the slide back on with the nursery vendors. You can do that. I like your dog there, Jeff. That's Buddy. He's pretty cute. Pretty cute. Okay, there's the nursery. All right, well, that brings us to around two o'clock. Um, and I really appreciate you all being here for the for the um, webinar again, but mostly I appreciate Jeff for sharing this information and doing the heavy lift that you did to kind of extend the knowledge of your colleagues in both of these um, crops. And I know that we learned a lot, I learned a lot, and I know that um, we can't wait to have you back for your next topic, Jeff. So keep up the good work down there and I'll see you next time I'm down in South Florida, okay? Okay, thank you, my All pleasure. Right. Take care, everybody.